much of what happens on Wall Street is felt across the globe. Investors take their lead from this financial hub. Now people angry about banks and bankers are doing the same. Occupy Wall Street, Wall Street under occupation. People arriving from everywhere. The Occupy movement has spread to London, to Rome, and here to downtown Dublin. We have probably in the region of 60 to 70 people who are sleeping here and hundreds of people who are coming by every day. Jonathan Sugarman isn't the kind of person you expect to meet at a rally against economic inequality. Hey, well done, everybody. After all, he was a big city banker, the very breed of 21st century capitalist who's brought thousands of people onto the streets all over the world. The, the banks have all been nationalised because they ran out of money. But this insider is now as appalled as okay. anyone here about a system that's making the poor pay for the mistakes of the rich. You have hospital wards shutting down, you have schools shutting down, you have public services that are now being curtailed because there's no money. The money's gone to the banks. Your money, my money, everyone's money has gone to the banks. What we need is for the regulation that exists to be enforced. Jonathan Sugarman has never spoken publicly about his experiences until now. In 2007, he became a very senior executive at Unicredit, Italy's biggest bank, one of the top five banks in Europe. He was the head of risk management in Ireland. As a bank, we have a licence to operate as a bank, which is very much like a driving licence. It says this is the speed you can go, this is what you can do, and you have to operate within these limits. And it was my job to make sure that that was done every day. Jonathan Sugarman monitored the back office, the people responsible for checking the trades and the traders out front. He soon realised the numbers weren't adding up. He suspected his bank was breaching strict rules over how much cash and assets it's required to hold in reserve. And I insisted that we notify the regulator immediately, which is precisely what we are required under the terms of our licence and under Irish law to do. How certain are you that Unicredit broke the law while you were there? A hundred percent certain. And to use the Irish expression, to be sure, to be sure, that is why I uh, brought in this London-based IT company, uh, which had a very good reputation in Dublin, and the result was pretty horrific, because whereas the breach that I had reported to the regulator was a breach of 20%, whereas the permissible deviation was 1%, they rang me up one evening, soon after they tied into our systems, linked into our systems, and said, your breach is actually 40%. When he raised the alarm with his chief executive, the response was dismissive. It was a systems error. The risk manager was instructed to continue approving the deals. Jonathan Sugarman was in the thick of a reckless banking culture that was on a collision course with disaster. Well, on the days that the system threw up these figures that I was told were incorrect, we would sign to say, oh, this is a system error and we're confident that everything's all right. And just carry on as we did before, never notified anyone. So when you think of the fact that when Nick Leeson brought down Bearings Bank, it collapsed over 800 million pounds, 
I was signing over 5 billion every day that we didn't have. Understanding the dictionary definition of the word and the fact that I spent four and a half years in prison, I am a criminal. I always knew what I was doing was wrong. Um, did I think it was criminal from inception? Absolutely not. It's been 16 years since Nick Leeson single-handedly brought down Britain's oldest bank, Bearings. It was such a spectacular, audacious, outrageous act of financial skullduggery, Hollywood made a movie about it. I mean, success was the thing that I always wanted. And, and you know, conversely, my biggest fear was the fear of failure. And the fear of failure was probably the one thing that I couldn't countenance. So putting my hand up and saying, look, there's this error that I should have closed yesterday, but I ran it into another day and therefore made the problem even worse, was the thing that I couldn't do. The bank was 233 years old. It had survived wars and the Great Depression, yet it took just one upstart 25-year-old futures trader to knock it over. Firstly, I didn't know that the bank was going to collapse. I didn't know what the capital base of the bank was. I wasn't really interested, as long as the money kept coming. And so, you know, I knew the effect of my actions would be dramatic. I didn't really understand they would be quite as catastrophic as they were. Before Leeson became a trader for bearings in Singapore, he was a backroom bookkeeper in London. He knew how to work the system, keeping his losses out of sight in a secret fund. He was so good at covering his tracks, Bearings thought he was making them millions and sent him more and more money to play with. It took the bank three years to wake up. By then, it was way too late. I didn't enjoy a moment of it. Um, you know, there was always the fear um, that what was happening was going to be exposed and, and that was always my, my, my greatest fear um, because that would have highlighted my incompetence and negligence and, and, and failure to everybody around me and that was the one thing that I didn't want to happen. Did you ever stop in that time to think that actually some one individual or bunch of individuals were actually losing that money? that you were hiding in that account? That that was someone or some institution's money? Um, no, I don't think you do. Nick Leeson was convicted of fraud and spent four years in a Singaporean jail. He was released in 1999 and returned to make a new life for himself in Ireland. When I first came back from Singapore in 1999, I used to, I, I was regularly asked, you know, do you think this can happen again? And I know my answer was always no. And the reason why it was no was I know how incompetent and negligent I was. I know how incompetent and negligent the bank was. I know how bad the auditors were. I know how bad the regulators were. I know how bad the central bank was at the time. And I just believe that if you try to, to build the probability of all that happening together at the same time in the future, the possibilities were extremely remote. London police have arrested a potential rogue trader who could have cost the Swiss banking group UBS an estimated $2 billion. The possibilities of it happening again were not so remote at all. Just months ago, 31-year-old Kwaku Adeboli became the latest trader accused of being a rogue. Based in London at the giant Swiss bank UBS, he was in charge of the Delta One desk, which traded complex financial products. Je pense qu'il n'y a pas de rogue trader sans rogue bank. C'est-à-dire que ce n'est possible que si la banque veut bien que ce soit possible. Despite the technological advances since Nick Leeson's days in Singapore, sophisticated systems monitoring traders and their activities, and claims by the banks themselves that they're vigilant, it's alleged Kwaku Adeboli did them blind. 
His so-called rogue trading started in 2008 at the height of the global financial crisis. And around the same time, the Swiss taxpayer was forking out $6 billion to rescue UBS from the brink of bankruptcy. La crise de 2007-2008 a abouti à des conférences, à des colloques où on a dit on va faire telle et telle chose et rien n'a été fait. Rien n'a été fait. Olivia Metzner is one of the world's most sought after criminal defense lawyers. His client, Jerome Coviel, is appealing a conviction for road trading at French bank Societe Générale. He's said to have gambled away six and a half billion dollars, the biggest trading loss in history. Just like the UBS scandal, Curviel was working on the Delta One desk, where he invented buyers and sellers and created phantom deals to hide his losses. Est-ce qu'il est normal que des dirigeants de banque qui, banque, qui mènent leur banque à la faillite ne soient pas sanctionnés pour cela Cela pose de vrais problèmes. Et effectivement, il est difficile pour les Français moyens de comprendre pourquoi, de temps en temps, on se focalise sur un Kerviel, sur un Nick Lisson, et pas sur les établissements bancaires. Here at the Palace of Justice in Paris, Jerome Curviel admitted that he'd made big mistakes that almost brought down one of France's biggest banks. But he wasn't about to take all the blame for what his legal team described as a rotten culture that encouraged excessive risk-taking, celebrating traders when the markets were up, only to isolate them when their bets turned bad. In this courtroom drama, calling Jerome Curviel a rogue trader allowed the bank to cast itself as the victim. Like Nick Leeson, before becoming a player himself, Jerome Curviel spent years in the bank's back office, recording trades and monitoring the traders. Because he did spend a lot of time in control teams, so he didn't know very well the controls, so he didn't know very well how to avoid the controls and to hide the position and to lie to people from controls when they asked questions. It is the worst nightmare of a banker. Uh, so Hugues Lebray was an executive director at Societe Generale when Jerome Curviel was caught. Was it the culture within the bank that inspired, encouraged excessive risk taking? That, that's what Curviel uh, say. I don't think uh, the culture was to take uh, excessive risks. But I think the culture was to make uh, more and more money in this uh, investment bank. By and taking more and more risk? By taking uh, more positions, inventing new products, uh, developing new activities. The activity of Kerviel was quite new. Uh, it was created a few years ago, a few years before. So uh, you certainly have in trading rooms a greed culture. Where greed. people greed, yeah, where people want to make more money, uh, to have higher bonuses. I think the biggest bonus I heard of in the banking system was about, I think it was close to 200 million. For one year's work? Yeah. There's very little in the way of reliable science behind what money market traders do, but science might help explain how they behave. During the dot-com bubble, I noticed that the behavior of traders changed, and changed very noticeably. They're normally quite a prudent lot, you know, um, yuppies with uh, a family. Um, but during the dot-com bubble, a lot of them, both on the trading floor and all along Wall Street, um, became euphoric, delusional. They had racing thoughts, diminished need for sleep. They were taking far more risk than they, were than they used to. Um, the risk was, had terrible risk-reward trade-offs. And they seemed hornier than usual, given the amount of pornography on their computer screens back in the days when you could have porn on your computer screens. 
I was only later to find out that these were clinical symptoms of mania. Figure the 14 now, 2002. Venus is looking 39 and about 35,000 if you want to buy 10 grand. John Coates spent 12 years on Wall Street, running his own derivatives trading desks at Goldman Sachs and at Deutsche Bank. He gave it all up to pursue a PhD at Cambridge. His specialty, neuroeconomics. The other thing I noticed at the time was that women were relatively immune to the behaviour I was seeing in the traders. So I was seeing this irrational exuberance. I thought it was chemical. It wasn't really happening with women, so there was sort of an obvious candidate for what that, that chemical may be. And that's how I began doing research on testosterone. In the first study of its kind in the world, John Coates took saliva samples in a dealing room, matching the change in the trader's natural steroids with their profit and loss profile. His research took into account the risks they were taking and volatility in the markets. What we found was that when the traders' testosterone levels were high in the morning, they made a lot more money in the afternoon than they did on days when their testosterone levels were low in the morning. And it was a very powerful effect. This was huge. I mean, this, was, this effect, if you had annualized it, would have added up to about a million pounds difference in their pocket at the end of the year. It may be just one factor among many driving traders, but what we do know from recent and current crises, the culture of risk within banks and by banks is a very powerful and very destructive force. And no one seems to know when risk becomes recklessness. What turned out during the housing bubble is that everybody was just taking huge risk. Everybody looked like a hero. And then when it blew up, everybody lost more money than they'd made in the past five years, but they didn't have to give back their bonuses. If they'd been assessed over a five-year period, I don't think they would have been taking as much risk as they were. If you do have a situation where people believe there's no way the bank can go under, maybe because the government taxpayer is standing behind it, that <clears throat> encourages, it's almost a license for all sorts of risk-taking, which ought to be properly disciplined by the marketplace. In Britain, Sir John Vickers has been trying to figure out how to protect the wider community from the rack and ruin of mischievous banking practices. Sir John is the warden of All Souls College at Oxford University. He was the former chief economist at the Bank of England and recently headed up an independent government review that recommended separating prudent traditional banking from the risky business of investment banking. The initial reaction was a very good one. The principles behind that, in a way, are to say the simple deposit taking, lending to individuals and small businesses through overdrafts and otherwise, that ha happens in the ring fence bank. People want to do the sophisticated stuff, the complicated things, the international things, that's fine, that's up to them. But we've got to have a structure where there's no way that the taxpayer can be dragged into backstopping that if the risks go bad. But over in Ireland, whistleblowers like Jonathan Sugarman don't have a lot of faith in regulators and their rules. Why did you leave Unicredit? Because we were breaking the law. And it was my name on the reports day in, day out. So under the eyes of the law, I'm the person responsible to make sure that we kept within our speed limit. And we went way beyond our speed limit on several occasions. And the law was very clear. I could face five years in prison for doing that. And I just didn't want to go to prison. He rang the alarm that his bank was in serious breach of liquidity rules, but the reaction has been painfully slow and inconclusive. This is a grossly serious matter, and it has been reported uh, to the financial regulator. There's been outrage in Parliament. And if we're not prepared to face this, and if we're not prepared to investigate it when the matters have been laid, then there is absolutely no hope for the financial system or for its reputation worldwide in this country. But four years on, 
even after Ireland was taken to the wall by aggressive, unsustainable banking, the Irish Central Bank says it's still looking into Sugarman's claims. And what did the police, the financial regulator, what did they do? Effectively nothing. Nothing at all. That is like walking to a police station with a knife with blood on it and say, I've just killed someone. And you expect the police to say, well, where's the body? Where's the person? What have you done? And they just say, fine. Just don't do it again. And that left me dumbfounded. Even one of history's most reckless operators has been astonished by the behaviour of banks. Nick Leeson questions their willingness to learn from their mistakes. You know, I, I got myself back on the electoral roll in, in the UK. The first mail I got was credit card companies offering me credit cards. You know, I had an injunction against me for 100 million. I'd lost 860 million of, uh, of an English bank's money and people were willing to offer me credit cards immediately on return. So it showed you straight away that the, you know, the controls and systems aren't in place that they need. Leeson is no longer allowed to work in banking, but he found a way of taking money from international banks anyway. He advises them on how to guard against the kind of behaviour he got away with at Bearings. You have to wonder if they're listening. The weakness is in those risk management, compliance and control areas. Always has been, still is and probably always will be. While the rogue trader has reinvented himself as banking consultant, the whistleblower is struggling. It took me a while to uh, pick myself up. And then when I started looking for other positions as a risk manager, I found a lot of shut doors. Um, it turned out that telling the truth doesn't really pay. Over the past 12 months, Jonathan Sugarman has been writing an anonymous blog, detailing his experiences at Unicredit. This is the first time he's revealed his identity. And as he continues to look for work, he can only wonder if the bank that one day takes him is playing fast and loose in a rogue system or has a rogue trader lurking in its ranks. Here we are in 2011 with the cost of billions to UBS because a trader who had come from the back office and was familiar with the systems knew how to get around them. Because of his insider knowledge of the system, much like Nick Leeson 20 years ago, he knew how to get around that. And that is what we the taxpayers pay the regulators, the policemen of the banks, to make sure cannot happen and does not happen. And here we are 20 years later, and it's still happening. Remarkably, the rogue traders didn't actually pocket any of the money they punted on the markets. It's the rest of us who are still paying the bill for their bad behaviour and for the selective blindness of their bosses.